I can give you a thousand. The cars are insane. The action is fierce. It's set a thousand years before The Witcher. There are monsters like we've never seen before. It has the first uh, kiss between two men in the show. The costumes are divine. The makeup, the hair. Bon There's a death. It's, like it's, like it's a show that's made with so much love, and that's really fun. Well, we definitely know that this show is going to be checking off some of those diversity checkboxes, but perhaps some more important questions to ask might be Is this show going to be entertaining? And is it going to be faithful to the lore? The answer to both of those questions is a resounding no. Not at all, not even in the slightest. This show is painful to watch. The Witcher Blood Origins is bad. Episode 1. It's clear that Netflix is desperately trying to capitalize on the popularity of Henry Cavill as The Witcher. Unfortunately for them, it's not quite working out so well. The first season of The Witcher was received with sort of a mixed reaction. While people very much enjoyed Henry Cavill as Geralt, the unorthodox style of storytelling and the time jumps in the first season caused some problems. Season 2 fixed that with the storytelling and time jumps, but it managed to create a whole bunch of new problems. Geralt was effectively sidelined and the story abandoned the established lore almost entirely in the second season. We now have season 3 and we know that it's going to be going even further off the rails to such a degree that it caused Henry Cavill to just outright quit the show because they are no longer being faithful to the lore. In addition, from the very start, the entire series has been plagued with woke garbage that's only gotten worse as the seasons have gone on. And that brings us now to the Witcher Blood Origins, which has ratcheted up even further. These go to 11. Without exaggeration, I would not be surprised in the slightest if there was a literal checklist that the show creators were using to try to score as many woke diversity virtue signaling points as possible. The trailer I played at the beginning of this video does a good job of proving that. Now, I've read some of the Witcher books, and while I definitely won't call myself an expert on the lore, I do know that this series, The Witcher Blood Origins, is not even remotely close to the established canon of The Witcher. It's simply another example of show creators and writers who don't have enough talent to create their own original content, and instead, they need to commandeer existing popular stories, and then they proceed to bastardize it. That is one big pile of shit. The episode opens with a very strange camera position. It's showing a battle, but for some reason the camera is upside down. The camera then slowly moves backwards, and I expected it to be showing a reflection in water or something, or possibly even being viewed from the perspective of a character that was hanging upside down somehow, except that's not the case. Instead, we get a character that just falls to the ground, and then the camera suddenly spins around, so now everything is upright. Now, I know what the show creators were trying to do with this, but they managed to completely screw it up because it just doesn't work. Congratulations. You're a failure. Regardless, the character turns out to be Jaskier, who was a prisoner of some kind for some reason. Right before he's about to be killed, everything around him freezes, and he appears to be the only one that can move. Then, a mysterious shape-shifting creature appears and takes him away from the fight. In the form of an elf, the creature says that she's traveled through different worlds and she needs his help. For some reason, she needs him to know the story of the first witcher, and then she claims that the first witcher was actually an elf. And already, this is something that is a serious break from canon, because, in the books, the first witchers were humans, specifically white men, which of course is not allowed, verboten in, in modern-day, current-year Hollywood. So how much do you want to bet that this first elf witcher in the show is going to end up checking off a whole bunch of diversity boxes? I'm guessing female, black, and probably gay. Well, it's tough to get any more obvious than that. Seems a pretty safe bet, because this is something that the woke weirdos in Hollywood have been doing for a while. For example, in Star Trek, it was retconned so that Spock, a white guy, was actually taught everything he knows by strong black female character. And then you have Doctor Who, where it was retconned that the first Doctor was actually strong black female character instead of white guy. Man, there seems to be a pattern with all of this. Coincidence? I think not! 
Essentially, this allows woke weirdos to kind of usurp the already previously established fan favorite characters, and it allows these woke weirdos to declare that the first true version, or the master, or the teacher of said character, was actually stunning and brave and diverse, and that the longtime fan favorite white guy character is just a lesser version, or he was a student, or he was the second one to do it, or whatever. The idea is that they need to replace that character and say, hey, look, look, something better and more diverse came before him, so he's not as good as you thought he was. It's all just a bunch of garbage. Most illogical. Continuing, the Elf Lady gives Jaskier a bunch of exposition, introducing the seven characters that are involved in this story. And what do you know, the leader of this merry little band is going to be Strong Black Woman. I'm so surprised. I am shocked. Shocked! For now, she's simply referred to as The Lark, because the show creators plan to do a name change in the middle of the episode, and it's gonna try to make her look really tough and strong, but it doesn't work at all, and it's just dumb. She also happens to be an elf which is really dumb. And I suppose this is as good a time as any to point out that just like with Lord of the Rings, in this fantasy universe, there are no black elves. They do not exist at all. And a whole bunch of the characters are going to be racistly blackwashed because of course. So here's the thing. The Witcher is based on Slavic and Germanic mythos. And those stories consisted only of white people because they are made by white people and there were only white people in that part of the world when these mythoses were created. However, in current year, that's not allowed, or at least it's not allowed for certain groups. And that is because anti-white racism is the only acceptable form of racism in America. There's a great example of this sort of thing in the MCU. There are three cities that are all similar, except one of them is not allowed to actually have any kind of uniformity. So we have the first one, which is the ancient city of Talo, which consists entirely of Asian people. Then you have the second one, which is Wakanda, which consists entirely of black people. And then you have Asgard, which is based on North mythology and should consist entirely of white people, except that is not allowed in current year. And as a result, Asgard must be made more diverse, which essentially means that they ended up racistly blackwashing half the people that live there. It's a blatantly obvious double standard, and once again, I get to make use of this image. The fact of the matter is that any stories based on Anglo-Saxon, Norse, or in this case, Slavic mythos, are being deliberately destroyed by a bunch of anti-white racist morons in Hollywood. And of course, if you criticize them for their blatant racism, these morons will have the audacity to pretend to be a victim and then falsely accuse you of the racism that they themselves are actually committing. When a film casts a black actor in a white role, any criticism of the film is racist. The point I'm trying to make here is that there are no black elves in The Witcher, and if you want to have a fantasy story with a bunch of black elves, then feel free to do so and write your own fucking story, you lazy, incompetent morons. Now, because of the severity of the racist blackwashing in this show, I'm not going to give individual stamps for characters. Instead, I'm just going to add five to the list and we'll call it a day. Continuing, we follow Malarkey as she walks into a small village and she plans on playing music in the tavern. First of all, I have to point out that the song she's singing is absolute fucking garbage. It is awful to listen to. But it gets even dumber than that because while she's singing, we need to get a good dose of my feminism. Obi. When it fits a woman. <laughs> During the song, one of the patrons, who of course is a white guy, decides to start harassing the waitresses, and he even gets a little handsy with her. Another woman who works there asks him to not cause trouble, and she'll give him free drinks if he just, you know, kind of ignores it, but he decides to hit her instead, and then the guy goes back to harassing the first waitress until suddenly he's hit in the leg with some kind of a dagger that was thrown by malarkey. Idiotic woke writers absolutely love including this kind of nonsense where, oh, it's a toxic white guy and he's causing problems and then strong black female character needs to put him in his place. Ugh, so transparent and it's so dumb, but don't worry, it gets worse. Several other men in the tavern try to attack Malarkey and of course she's able to easily defeat all of them with no effort whatsoever, but hey, at least one of the guys attacking her is black, so I guess that means that the scene has been 
kind of upgraded instead of being racist man hating now it's just now it's just man hating i mean i guess that's i guess it's supposed to be better i suppose <sighs> After the fight's over, the people in the tavern begin cheering for Malarkey, and she goes back to singing her absolutely fucking awful song. But what's even dumber is that someone in the audience yells out, You go, girl! As if it's some sort of stupid TikTok video. Yes, queen, what? Why are these morons using modern slang in a fantasy story? Good job, you no-talent hack writers. <laughs> It then moves over to a major city where a royal family is being attacked in the street. However, they're protected by bodyguards known as the Dog Clan, and we're told that among them, the greatest warrior is known as Fall Stoneheart. Because why bother going through all the effort of showing us that this character is actually good at fighting, when instead you could just, you know, drop some exposition and tell the audience. That's how it's supposed to work, right? You can't just have your characters announce how they feel! During the fight, he's able to pick up the princess, but as they're riding away, the street they're on gets blocked off from both sides. Stoneheart gives a dagger to the princess, and she hides in an alcove, while Stoneheart kills a whole bunch more of the attackers, and then it's revealed at the end that someone tried to sneak up from the other direction, but the princess was able to stab him with the dagger. Now you might be thinking, hang on a second here, this is not very progressive, you know, allowing the man to save the helpless princess? After all, it makes the female character look weak, and that's not allowed. Oh, ho, ho, ho. you would think that, but just you wait because the next scene has the princess safely back in her room and Stoneheart goes to see her. He gives her back the dagger so she can continue to protect herself and then she says, you saved me, and he responds by saying, no, you saved yourself. What are you talking about? This is unbelievably stupid and very obvious what the writers are trying to do. As I said, the woke nonsense doesn't allow male characters to be heroes, specifically when it comes to rescuing women. So they needed to include this mind-numbingly stupid line of dialogue in order to make it so that the princess was not actually helpless. She was equally responsible for her own protection, you know, even though she only stabbed the one guy in the dark alley. Meanwhile, Stoneheart somehow managed to kill like a dozen of the fighters, but hey, they're practically the same, right? Woke writers are so pathetic that they need to tie everything into knots to justify their insane agenda. It's then revealed that these two are actually in a secret relationship, and that's not allowed because he's lowborn and she's a princess, and we've seen this a million times. Some of the other guards go to check in on the princess, and oops, they happen to walk in on Stoneheart, giving the princess something else that was really hard, and it wasn't his heart. When a guy's banging you, as a punishment, he's exiled from both the kingdom and the dog clan. Later, it goes back to the castle where the king is visiting the princess, and apparently that's his sister, and she's talking about some sort of stupid prophecy stuff. And he really doesn't care about it, and instead he tells her that he's going to marry her off to a king of some other land so that they can have a long-lasting peace treaty. And of course, the show is trying to paint him as some sort of evil, toxic man who feels like he can control the life of this woman. What the writers are too fucking stupid to understand, however, is that this sort of thing is the role of nobility. It is expected that they will marry into strong families in order to secure important things like peace or power or prosperity. The king himself will likely need to do the exact same thing and marry someone in another family that maybe he doesn't really even care about, but he needs to because it's his role as a member of the royal family. Also, since the goal of having his sister marry the other king is to end a war that's been going on for a thousand years, it's kind of stupid to try to paint him as being a toxic member of the patriarchy when his goal is to end a war and secure peace. As dumb as all that is, there's something else that I absolutely need to point out in this scene, and it's this right here. For whatever reason, they decided that they didn't want to use torches or candles in this fantasy show. Instead, the princess picks up this thing, which is very, very obviously a literal flashlight in a can. Sure, there's a little curvy thing on the top to try to make it more fantastical, but holy shit, this is some top-notch laziness. They literally put a flashlight in a can, and they tried to pass it off as, as, as like, some sort of magical light source. It is so dumb. <laughs> 
We're then introduced to a new character even more fucking ridiculous than the Bob Marleys we saw in the House of the Dragon show. This time we get a black elf with a mohawk. <laughs> I guess the writers on this show were really big fans of World of Warcraft and they decided to include a night elf mohawk. I'm Mr. T and I'm a night elf mohawk. Regardless, Mr. Elf T is able to travel between the realms and he goes to one of these other worlds where he begins talking to what appears to be a stock animation from Adobe After Effects. <laughs> We spared no expense. He tells the Blue Sparkles that his assassination attempt on the royal family failed and that he needs more help. The scene then transitions back to the tavern with Malarkey, where we get some more exposition telling us how amazing she is. And then we learn that the other girl from before has some sort of visions, but suddenly a bunch of town guards show up to arrest Malarkey for beating up the guys from before. Which, after all, makes a lot of sense because it's not like there was an entire room full of people in the tavern who were witness to what happened. Nope, not at all. It never happened. No way. It never happened. Malarkey is then thrown into the prison and she recognizes the other person that's in there and it happens to be Stoneheart. Apparently, these two are from different factions and they have been fighting frequently throughout history. Malarkey wants to fight, but Dogman just doesn't care. And also, I have to point out that Malarkey's fighting stance here is one of the funniest and dumbest things that I've ever seen. It's like the director told her to just look as stupid as possible, and man, she definitely pulled it off. We have purposely trained him wrong, as a joke. Malarkey does end up attacking him and steals his necklace, but the guards come back around and tell the Dogman that he's free to go, and they stop the fight. Back in the castle, the king is telling his advisors about his plans to end the Thousand Year War, which includes marrying off his sister to one of the kings, and then he also is going to give some land to one of the queens from another kingdom. The advisors don't like this, but the king says that his people are suffering, and he wants the war to end. Again, not exactly the toxic patriarchy that the show wants to portray him as. It then goes back to the village, where Dogman is met with his, um... Uh, his, uh... Cousin? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I can definitely see the, uh, I can see the family resemblance. It's, it's uncanny. He's black? Regardless, his, um, cousin says that the clan wants to take him back, but Dogman refuses. Now, you might have noticed that there seems to be some kind of a problem with the progression of time in between all of these scenes. And by that, I mean... It's completely fucking broken. Time travel! Let's run through this. The Dogman rescues Princess, the two of them sleep together, he gets exiled, and then the king tells the princess that he's going to marry her off to some other king in order to secure a peace. All of this occurs in the span of a single day. The next time we see the Dogman, he's in some far-off land being held in a prison. And from what we'll see later in the episode, this place is so far away you need to cross an ocean and it takes weeks to get there. And yet, the next time we see the king, he's announcing to his advisors that his sister is going to marry and there's going to be a peace treaty. So then we go back to the Dogman as he's being released by his <coughs> cousin, who has already arrived to tell him that he needs to go back. Now, how is it that this cousin could go there and find him in such a short span of time, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. All of this seems to take place in the span of only a couple days, and yet you have characters that are traveling unbelievably large distances almost instantly because it's happening off screen. None of what has been happening can actually be considered storytelling. Instead, it's just a string of events that are glued together with some extreme plot contrivance. The buffoonery is endless. But don't worry, it gets worse. In the prison, it's revealed that Malarkey stole the necklace from the Dogman when she attacked him. She then uses it to pick the lock by just jamming it in there and wiggling it around a little bit. And this looks all the more absurd because the necklace pendant thing is very clearly too large to actually fit into the lock. So unless this lock only has one pin located at the very, very front, none of this is actually gonna work. How is it that the prop department on this awful show was so stupid that they didn't realize that the lock picking pendant was too big to fit in the actual lock that they also created for this scene. Great job, guys. 
you're almost as good as the writers. Ooh, that one hurt. Malarkey ends up escaping. She heads back to the tavern in order to pick up her musical instrument. But when she gets there, she's surprised to see that her sister is waiting for her. Apparently, in this world, people are capable of tracking down family members no matter where they go because this is the second time in five minutes that it's happened. But I need to point out that the sister's actions make no sense whatsoever because apparently Malarkey was being sentenced to death for the crime of attacking the guys in the tavern, you know, even though there was a room full of people that saw that she was defending the other person. None of that matters. The better question is, why was the sister just sitting in the tavern playing the stupid musical instrument? If Malarkey had been sentenced to death, why was the sister not doing anything to try to get her out? Why would she just be waiting in the tavern? Are we supposed to figure that the sister somehow knew that Malarkey was going to be put into the prison with another person that just so happened to have a necklace with a pendant that would be capable of picking the lock so that Malarkey could escape? The sister is just somehow aware of this? How? Details matter. Regardless, the reason why the sister is here is because she needs to get Malarkey to go back in order to provide protection for the monarchies when they're signing during the treaty. Keep that in mind, it's very important for later on. The entire reason why the sister is here to get Malarkey is so that she will have enough time to go back and be there during the treaty signing. The sister says that she's going to be leaving very soon, but until then, Malarkey can think it over. Then the other girl, the waitress, comes into the tavern and gives Malarkey a hug. And then she begins shaking and having a vision and spouting out a prophecy. My opinion on this type of story element is that for the most part, I think including prophecies in a story is generally a bad idea but sometimes it can work out if the prophecy is incredibly well constructed and also happens to be quite vague. For example, I think the prophecies that are used in the Game of Thrones work well because they can be interpreted in several different ways and that difference of interpretation actually leads to some of the conflict in the story and I think that they work out for the most part. However, the prophecy that's delivered here in this show was clearly written in the most obvious and dumbest way possible. This is the prophecy given by the waitress girl. She says, The time of the spheres is upon us. Worlds will eat worlds. A great beast born shall be slain by your blade. A quest in the name of your clan will bring you redemption. I gotta say, that is some, uh... That is some impressive prophesizing right there. I'm sure the writers worked extra super duper hard to come up with, you know, something as complicated as spelling out exactly what's going to happen later on in the episodes. It that's, that's, must have been really difficult for them to come up with that. You are so stupid! You don't even know what you're fucking writing! Malarkey heads outside and meets up with her sister, but as they're leaving the village, they suddenly are under attack, and the sister is struck by a couple of arrows and falls over dead. Then about a dozen guys pop out from hiding, and of course, she's able to kill almost all of them completely effortlessly, courtesy of some very compliant stuntmen and some awful choreography. You're saying it's a woman's game because women are weak and need more help. Yes. However, she doesn't take out the last three, and instead, this falls to Dogman. He kills one of them, basically saving her life in the process, something that she never actually thanks him for, and then he takes out another one, and then we have the third guy. An extremely obvious motion that he's going to throw his axe at the last remaining guy, and this guy seems to have gone to the Prometheus School of Running Away, which is also known as the Rick and Stark method, and he just runs in a straight line, which lets Dogman very easily hit him in the back with the axe. They begin inspecting the bodies of the soldiers, and they find out that they're all from different armies that serve different kingdoms, and they come to the immediate and miraculous conclusion that it's the armies that want to stop the treaty and then take out the monarchies for some reason. Dogman suggests that they should travel together because it will be safer if there's more ambushes. However, Malarkey says that she doesn't trust him, which is utterly nonsensical. If you recall, she is the one that attacked him first. She is the one that stole from him. And in return, he came back and saved her life during the fight. And now he's offering to work with her 
So why is it that she doesn't trust him? It should be the complete other way. Unless, of course, she's just a complete and total fucking idiot, which of course she is. What good are you? Do you have a brain? We then get some very cringe dialogue from both these characters. Dogman takes his pendant back and he says, I don't trust you either, Lark. And he specifically uses her name because it needs to set up her following sentence and her response. She responds by saying, they killed my sister. The Lark is dead. My name is Ali or Ali or Ali or something. I don't know, whatever. But basically, the whole point of this is that Dogman needs to say, oh, you're the Lark. And she's like, no, I'm not the Lark. I'm this other person and I'm super tough. And she even does this right here. Like she's trying to portray herself as being, oh, she's tough and she's mean and she's angry now and someone's going to pay. And no, it doesn't work. I couldn't help but laugh at this. It's all incredibly forced. And, you know, the whole look at me, I'm changing my name and somehow it means I'm more threatening. No, no, give me a fucking break. Get out of here with this. We then move over to a scene with all the monarchs who have gathered together to sign the treaty. However, as soon as the king begins speaking, several people start leaving the room. This includes Mr. Alfty, making it pretty obvious that something bad is about to happen. And then a moment later, the princess also makes an excuse in order to leave the room. So we saw that Mr. Elfty has left the room, and now miraculously the princess also has a reason to leave the room. I don't even need to watch the rest of this scene to know that everyone in this room is going to end up dead. Everything in this show is simplistic and predictable. Regardless, after stepping outside, the princess kills one of the guards and has the door blocked off. Then suddenly we're met with the arrival of... Uh... Terrible CGI. I started blasting. Bah, wow. bah. And just as expected, everyone in the room is killed by the terrible CGI. However, this opens up some pretty big problems. The terrible CGI shoots lightning bolts that are able to instantly disintegrate any person it touches. And these lightning bolts move so fast that it appears to be almost impossible to dodge them. Although I'm sure that a certain black female elf is going to be able to somehow dodge them later on in the series. <coughs> <laughs> But then it's revealed that Mr. Elfty is the one who's controlling the terrible CGI. And I have to ask, if Mr. Elfty is able to control this terrible CGI that can instantly disintegrate a hundred people with no effort, including many of them being armed soldiers who are not able to harm the terrible CGI in any way, then why is Mr. Elfty even bothering to work with the princess or any of the others? Controlling this terrible CGI would make him effectively the strongest person in the world. I mean, he can wipe out entire armies with this terrible CGI and just kind of sit back and watch. I mean, no one would be able to stand up against him. So why is he even bothering to work with anyone? I mean, later on, we're going to get the stupid dialogue from him that says that, well, he's a lowborn and they'll never accept him as the emperor and this and that. And it's like, what does it really matter? You can control the terrible CGI that can quite literally destroy entire cities. So why is it that it even matters if they're willing to accept you because you're lowborn and whatever, whatever? That doesn't matter. You have the most powerful thing in the entire world. You can do whatever you want. None of this makes any sense anymore. Regardless, the princess is now named Empress of the New Golden Empire, and she's able to do this because the armies of those three kingdoms all want to support her for whatever bizarre, vague reasons. However, the following scene shows that she's nothing more than a figurehead, and that Mr. Alfty and the generals are actually the ones in charge. Now, you might be wondering, hang on a second here, wasn't Malarkey and Dogman supposed to be able to go back to the treaty signing in order to protect their monarchs? I mean, that was why both of them had family members that went to get them. But remember, these people are basically on the other side of the world. Malarkey and Dogman are going to have to actually cross an entire ocean in order to get back to them. So even if they had left immediately, Dogman couldn't possibly have gone back there. And Malarkey definitely couldn't because her sister arrived even later. So there was absolutely no possible way that they could have gotten back there in time for the treaty signing. So what the hell was even the purpose of sending the cousin and the sister to go out there in the first place? Like, you're not going to be able to get... like. The whole reason why they went there was to get them to bring them back for the treaty signing so they could be there. But now we know it is physically impossible for Malarkey and Dogman to actually have gotten back there in time. Like, were the writers just not realizing that? They did, just, did they just forget? That's what turns me on about you. 
your attention to detail. Eventually, Malarkey and Dogman arrive at a city where they see banners all over the place of this new thing called the Golden Empire, and these two idiots decide to go to a tavern to try to learn some information about what's been going on. And the thing is, they don't even need to ask anybody any questions about what has been happening, because luckily for them, a group of people sitting at a table about 10 feet away start talking very loudly and spouting a whole bunch of exposition about the exact situations that these two idiots needed to know about. It's very convenient. Very convenient. The group of people talk about what the princess did and also about the terrible CGI thing that killed everybody in that room, except the people in the tavern refer to it as the beast. And they do this repeatedly with emphasis on the word beast. And hey, you remember that prophecy from a few minutes ago where Malarkey was supposed to slay the beast? And then you have the people in the tavern who keep referring to the monster as the beast. Hey, there's the beast that took out the people. And then it's a really dangerous beast. Wow, I don't know if anybody can destroy the beast. Good job, writers. You're about as subtle as a fucking freight train. <laughs> Then a couple of guards show up at the tavern, waving around some wanted posters for both Malarkey and Dogman, but the two of them manage to escape without anyone noticing. Later that night, these two idiots are talking about what happened, and asking how they can trust each other because they're both from different clans. Malarkey then says that they can trust each other by the blade, and then both of them take a knife and they draw a little bit of blood and they shake hands. And this scene is pure cringe. Both the dialogue and the acting is hilariously bad. I hate this. It is revolting. They decide they need more help and they're going to visit Malarkey's old swordmaster. And I think now is a good time to mention another problem in this show. Yeah, there's another one. There is a tremendous amount of ADR and this is automated dialogue replacement. This is a technique normally used when a scene is filmed on the set and the audio doesn't quite come out as good as it should have and it requires the actors to re-record their dialogue in a studio which is then dubbed over the scene, usually when the camera is focused on another character so you can't see that the character's lips don't match up with the audio that they're supposedly saying. And it's fairly easy to tell when this sort of thing is happening because ADR sounds significantly different than the audio that you would have had captured on the set. You know, there are different things, distance from the microphone, the wind blowing, all that sort of stuff kind of makes it more real when the sound is recorded on the set. But when it's recorded in a studio, all of that is gone. It's just a, you know, an empty studio room and the audio sounds way, way different. I bring this up because I noticed that there was a significant amount of ADR used in this show. Like when these two idiots were on the boat in the middle of the ocean. Even though the entire scene was CGI, the camera was placed very far away so you couldn't actually see the characters. You just saw all the waves moving around and the boat kind of getting thrown around a little bit and stuff. But then we heard dialogue from both of these characters as if they were just sitting down in a room and having a casual conversation. It doesn't really sound right and it doesn't fit. And it obviously it looks wrong and it sounds wrong. But then later we see these two traveling on horseback. And again, the camera is placed very, very far away from them. So we can't actually see their face and we can't see their lips moving. And we have Again, crystal clear ADR, which had been recorded in a studio. As I said, all of this sounds wrong and it's very off-putting. And either the show creators were extremely lazy and just didn't want to film some of these scenes, or they realized that they needed to include extra dialogue in order for certain things to fit better. And they just had to kind of, you know, we'll fix it in post kind of situation. In either case, the amount of ADR is absurd and reeks of incompetence. Eventually, these two idiots make it to a place where the Swordmaster can be found, and Malarkey warns Dogman to be careful of traps that have been set into the ground, and he starts gloating and bragging, like, I know where the traps are, I'm not gonna get stuck in them, and all this and the, that sort of thing. And then, of course, he immediately falls into one of these traps because he's just a dumb man, and he needs to be shown as incompetent and put in his place by strong female characters, because fucking, of course. <sighs> it then moves over to Mr. Elfty, who is once again talking to the Blue Sparkles. He says that he raised a whole bunch of the Black Monoliths 
when they will help them to move to different worlds, but because he's lowborn, the people will never see him as an emperor, and so he needs the blue sparkles to give him chaos magic so that he'll be powerful enough that no one can ever question him. Once more, I will point out that simply being able to control the terrible CGI monster that's able to disintegrate entire armies probably would have been enough. I don't think you actually need chaos magic, but whatever. Back with the two idiots, they manage to find the Swordmaster, and Malarkey tries to convince her to help them. Oh yeah, it should be mentioned that the Swordmaster is supposed to be the best fighter in the whole wide world. So of course it has to be a woman. You know, it definitely would not be allowed to be a man. It has to be a woman. I mean, who could have possibly predicted that? You know, except everyone. But don't worry, it gets worse. At first, Mulan completely refuses to go on the little quest, but Malarkey picks up an empty scabbard that is sitting in the tent nearby, and she says that if Mulan comes and helps her, that she'll be able to get the sword of her ancestors, which is currently being held by the Empire. And the name of this sword is the Soul Reaver. I'm sorry. What? The Soul Reaver. You know, the name of the sword that was also used in the Legacy of Kain video game series? How much you want to bet that this version of the Soul Reaver is going to do basically the exact same thing as the Soul Reaver from the video game series? I suppose it could be worse though. The show creators could have tried to call the sword Excalibur. Strange women lying in ponds distributing swords is no basis for a system of government. I know the writers on this show have no talent whatsoever and they need to steal and bastardize content made by others, but come on, this is... what are you doing? Eventually, they're able to convince Mulan to go on their little journey, and the three of them leave together. So far, this show has managed to do pretty much everything wrong. It's some of the lowest quality amateur work I've ever seen. The script reads like it was written by a 10-year-old who needed to turn in a homework assignment, and he didn't start until a half an hour before the class was due. Whatever the show creators for this series are currently being paid, it is way, way more than they deserve. But thankfully, that's the end of episode one. I'm taking shots at the enemy. I'm gonna make it to the top, leave a legacy. If I got something to say, you better let me speak. Turn it up a new degree, bitch, you ain't seen anything. I pop off with the new rock, electronic, blow the sun